Um, World Suicide Prevention Day is now uh, happening for the 15th year, so it's organized by the International Association for Suicide uh, Prevention. And um, this is the 15th year that this day is happening. Over the years, so many activities have happened uh, that we also have expanded it throughout the week. So the, the key statement for this year is uh, take a minute, change a life. And that is particularly uh, coming from the evidence that we do know that when people are depressed or suicidal, that proactive approaches do help, that they really contribute to making a difference, making uh, a change. And uh, Caroline, who's working with YASP, has helped me to put up the latest uh, updates, particularly for what's happening this week, and we're not even towards the end of the week. But even looking back at last year, a very impressive number of activities in, in many countries, and over 1.5 million hits on the website to access the uh, relevant information. Um, for us this week, for various reasons, is also very busy, so in addition to doing this seminar, we usually jump on the bicycle and we do uh, a cycle as well. We didn't get to that yet, um, but I, I, I know from Caroline that we can, we can cycle until the 17th of September, so you can still register and contribute. And as you can see, young and old are contributing to, uh, to the cycle. So in the context of... Um, Ongoing research, completed research, but, but also first findings. I put together a presentation that I think uh, brings forward some very important information on uh, risk factors, protective factors, and I would like to focus in this lecture particularly on some subgroups because quite commonly people think, oh, depression is an important risk factor for everybody in terms of self-harm or suicide. That's not really the case. And in recent times, we hear a lot about alcohol. Yes, it is important, but it depends on what type of risk group or subgroup we're looking at. So uh, I would like to start focusing a little bit more on what we know about young people, new findings, then move to some uh, updates on what we know about people in their middle ages. And at the end, I really would like to show you some very current and new findings, which is part of a HRB-funded project where uh, we have first findings that are certainly very innovative, but also show us that um, when people require treatment, uh, specific interventions, we have to find the best match between the needs of the person and the evidence-based interventions. And in fact, we have also discovered in this study, or the ongoing study, that the so-called evidence-based interventions do not work for everybody. So I would like to show some examples there. For some of you, this is not new news. So the, the overview of uh, trends in Ireland in terms of suicide and undetermined death, so it's between uh, 2005 and 2015. And the peaks there in the middle, they clearly represent the impact of the economic recession, but also so-called austerity measures. And it was particularly men, men in their younger ages and middle ages who were uh, affected. Uh, I also uh, included um, the rates in terms of <laughs> undetermined deaths, because um, we have set up some very, um, let's say, well-functioning system with the coroners, particularly in Cork City and Cork County, and what we discovered is that uh, through very in-depth investigations in these consecutive cases that about half, so about 50% of the cases that are classified as undetermined deaths are very likely to be probable cases of suicide. But because of the well, traditional procedure in terms of the coroners determining verdicts of suicide, they, in, in those cases, they don't have access to sufficient evidence to determine uh, the case of suicide. So, so under, in many circumstances, we can say usually the realistic figures are higher than what we get in terms of the confirmed cases of uh, suicide. 2015 does indicate that maybe we're on a downward trend, but we have to be very careful because the 2015 rates are still preliminary. And in, in each year, the final figures are always significantly higher than the preliminary figures. So it's just to give you some context. Moving from suicide to self-harm, so our national self-harm registry, year on year, and, and this is now in fact going on for um, 13 years, so we started in 2002, that there is a predominant uh, overrepresentation of young people, uh, adolescents, young adults, and particularly 
uh, young young girls. And, and when we look at the, the, uh, the specific ages, 10 to 24, we even see relatively high rates in children and the young uh, adolescents. And that this is particularly a worrying trend in uh, recent uh, years. What is also a worrying trend is the ongoing increase, and particularly in the younger age group, so both males and females, the, the ongoing increase in the use of highly lethal methods. So um, we don't want that to be spelled out in the media, but it is very important for us to know. And initially, when we didn't have the long-term trend, we, we assumed that this was again down to the recession and the austerity measures. But as you can see, the increasing trend already started there in uh, 2004 and, uh, and 2005. It's particularly stark in the, in the males, but it is uh, also happening in the females. We don't have a very clear-cut explanation for that at the moment, but there's certainly uh, a link with how information on lethal methods of self-harm is being distributed around social media or even in the traditional media. So that is certainly an important uh, factor. In terms of this uh, session, I, I don't have enough time to go into great detail of all the particular studies, but this is a very important evidence-based list of important risk factors associated with self-harm in girls, so adolescent girls, uh, particularly Elaine McMahon, who's here with us. She's been working on some of the school-based, population-based uh, surveys, and we consi consistently find very important evidence for these risk factors. And Coincidentally or not, we, uh, we know that Senator Francis Black is, is uh, stimulating the debate on alcohol and self-harm and suicide, and we can say this is strongly evidence-based because it is a major challenge uh, for girls, for boys, but also for uh, adults. There's important evidence in terms of the so-called modeling effect, so knowing others who have engaged in self-harm or, or even suicide, so that's an important uh, factor. And there's a range of other uh, factors as well, but very importantly also sexual and physical um, abuse and maltreatment. Uh, <coughs> One of the recent findings, I looked up some recent reviews, is also an important growing link with so-called sleep disorders or sleep uh, problems. Um, and in the studies that looked at that, it was particularly associated with the preoccupation or almost non-stop being occupied on social media. So it's not, it's not primarily linked to a depression or anxiety. This may evolve, but it's very much linked to day and night being uh, involved in the social uh, media. And interestingly, that accounts for the boys as well. So, it's, so it seems to be a kind of consistent trend that we see across uh, young people. When we look at these findings uh, via one a big uh, European study in which Ireland was involved, but also the second study, which was uh, we had publications about that earlier this year, so saving and empowering young lives in Ireland, um, we also have detected that um, there is a narrowing of the gender gap, not only in terms of uh, prevalence of self-harm in boys and girls, but also the types of risk factors. Because if you if you look at risk factors associated with self-harm in, in boys, they have similarities with the girls, particularly the, the very significant ones, so alcohol, drug abuse, but also knowing others who have engaged in uh, self-harm. We don't particularly per se see sexual abuse or physical maltreatment, but we see problems related to sexuality and, and based on the qualitative information that the young people gave to us, this, this, this can be interpreted particularly as gender identity confusion or any, any uh, concerns or changes or, or uh, issues they have with, uh, with that. Bullying is obviously also important and problems with schoolwork and again the sleep uh, problems. I usually use this overview in um, a training uh, session and, and because we're not such a huge group I still would like to ask some of you as to what you find quite striking if you look at had the most frequently reported motives related to self-harm, and this is then uh, distinguished by boys and uh, girls. So it's, it's self-reported motives associated with one or multiple acts of uh, self-harm. So what do you find striking when you look at that? You would have 
imagine that once it's a dye might be bigger, you know, might be... Yeah, that's bigger. maybe one... Bigger, one a bigger wolf of like... Yeah, yeah, that's one important observation. But overall, we're, well, we're talking here about a combination of uh, highly lethal methods, but also low lethal methods. Eh? So the usually the lower lethal methods, such as superficial self-cutting, they could be associated with usually self-punishment or even revenge or, or any, uh, any other motives. Anything else striking? Yeah, yeah, so that is the most prevalent uh, motive. And what do you think does that represent? Because uh, if you take a step back and you say, you know, wanting a relief from state of mind, so maybe high level of stress, how is it possible then, or why would somebody engage in self-harm to get that relief uh, from, from stress? They don't have yeah, exactly. So, so the, it's 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 uh, really also indicating a lack of coping uh, skills. Um, we we identified these findings already many years ago, and in the most recent sale study, saving and empowering your lives, that this was confirmed uh, as well. Another important finding here, and um, I I can't dwell too much too long on it, but to our surprise, we discovered that in uh, this was a fairly large sample. It was replicated in many countries. Um, almost nowhere we found people who solely, uniquely reported wish to die as the only motive. So wish to die was always reported in combination with, let's say, a more, well, what's more positive, but certainly a more externally uh, directed uh, motive. And for us this was major in in insight or major new information to highlight or to underline the ambivalence. So in other words, there was nobody who only reported wish to die. So there was always a motive that was linked to uh, improving somebody uh, or improving somebody's relationship or any other aspects in their uh, lives. And that's a very important insight because we still come across nurses and doctors who talk about the so-called um, uh, unsuccessful suicide, and obviously that's not even a great wording uh, to use, uh, but they, they solely think there's always the wish to die, and that's not the case. It's a huge range of other uh, motives. Then also, uh, in recent times, a very uh, uh, high-quality study was done by Lucy Biddle in, um, uh, in Bristol. So in a population of 20-year-olds, quite a large uh, sample of people who had made suicide attempts and there was uh, a significant uh, proportion of people, so three quarters, had had some kind of internet uh, use, particularly related to suicide and suicide uh, methods. And one in five had also accessed sites giving specific information on how to harm yourself. And again, this is where obviously uh, media guidelines and some regulation is uh, very important. <coughs> Giving some <coughs> pointers here, maybe the best question to ask here is, who doesn't know the Netflix series, 13 Reasons Why? Everybody knows it, <laughs> so, yeah, so, so yeah, this series came out, uh, it was late March, it came from the uh, US, and at that stage I was still very involved in the International Association for Suicide Prevention, and we immediately became concerned about the potential copycat or contagion of uh, suicide. So you, since everybody knows the series, so uh, it's about the young girl, Hannah Baker, um, who uh, at the end of the series takes her life and it's completely full-blown uh, shown. And so she steps in the bath, uh, cuts her wrist, and then you see her uh, dying. But prior to that, she has prepared 13 tapes, um, recordings, they all relate to different people whom she thinks have caused or at least contributed to her uh, suicide. And in the International Association we have access now to probably national representatives in 50 countries and in most of the countries we have now already seen or in the first month evidence of copycats, so of very similar type uh, cases and for example my colleague in Austria, he reported that there was even uh, a suicide pact. So two girls of a similar age, 
they had dressed themselves in exactly the same way as Hannah Baker, and they had decided on the same day to step in the baths and to take their lives in the same way. One person died and one was saved at the just, just, in, just in time. And interestingly, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I came across a case in uh, Peru. Um, the method of suicide was exactly the same, but also this person had left 13 tapes and referring to situations in his life. It was, it, by the way, this was a man, so that was quite striking. Um, but also uh, great similarities with the whole story. So you see this immediate effect of copycat. And uh, in recent uh, weeks, there has been an interesting uh, review of, uh, this was published in, in, in JAMA, so where there's clear indications of uh, an increase in internet searches, so how to commit suicide, and this is the terminology of these sites, uh, how to kill yourself, so, so you see the huge impact of something like that. And we, we do know from a lot of previous research that this would immediately impact on adults, but it's particularly children and adolescents who see this who would be uh, very much affected uh, by this. When working, when we work in this area, it's always very hard to preempt, to anticipate a situation, so to be in time uh, before somebody takes his or her life. But with the fast speeding social media, that's even more challenging and more uh, difficult. Um, and it's also very challenging that you, you can in one jurisdiction have quite proactive approaches, you can have uh, internet safety regulations, but this may again be very difficult, diff different in another jurisdiction. So we can't, it's very hard for us to control and to monitor that. Uh, then also, and this is currently a debate in Ireland, who exactly at government level uh, is responsible for improving regulation to also find out uh, what, what, is the, what would be safer options and how can we monitor these uh, developments. And another important challenge is um, we, we, we do have media guidelines for suicide reporting. They were already published in 2008 and they have been updated. But they may now be known to some extent by people in the print media, but they're not very well known by Facebook, uh, Twitter and, and many other uh, agencies. And also, um, <coughs> so when Netflix came out, we had discussions with uh, the Netflix office um, uh, and we wondered whether the team had any considerations or any regulations. Um, but then we also find out that the director of 13 Reasons Why uh, is uh, a young director who has so far made Disney movies uh, and, and yeah, you, you, how can we expect that somebody like that would be aware of the WHO media guidelines for suicide reporting. So it's also how do we get the message across other agencies that are so wide uh, ranging. Moving on a slightly more uh, positive note, uh, particularly in the last five to ten years we have uh, growing evidence on terms of what works, what are effective interventions, and uh, particularly for uh, children, adolescents, and, and young adults, uh, cognitive behavior therapy has shown positive outcomes in terms of reducing self harm, but also, for example, reducing suicidal ideation. Dialectic behavior therapy, particularly for adolescents, it's a very intensive approach. It's at least eight to 12 months psychotherapy. Uh, with adolescents, but it's very much focused on those young people who already have a history of repeated uh, self-harm. Currently, there are only two RCTs. Um, one has shown uh, more significant outcomes than the other, but the outcomes are going in the right uh, direction. Very small number of studies have looked at home-based family therapy, so it's particularly for children, and then both family members and the individuals themselves are involved. And again, the CBT approach seems to have proven uh, fairly uh, effective. Some interventions in terms of brief compliance enhancement and what that means is when a child or an adolescent is assessed and, and requires a certain intervention, that they're not just being sent off, but that they're being guided until they have arrived uh, in the session or at the meeting with the psychotherapist or the psychologist. And that has shown 
to contribute to positive um, and effective uh, outcomes. So far about intervention, so what can we do when we detect that people have self-harmed or are at risk of suicide, but what can we do beforehand? And again, I'm glad Elaine is here because she has done a lot of work uh, with the Saving and Young Lives in Europe uh, group. And so far we can say that this awareness uh, uh, program, so this approach that has been implemented and tested in many schools in Cork and Kerry, but also in many other countries in Europe, has shown very consistent outcomes. Uh, so it's the first uh, mental health awareness program that has shown significant reductions in suicide attempts at the follow-up uh, sessions, but also reduction in suicidal ideation and improvements in the so-called protective factors, so, such as coping skills and, and, uh, and other uh, aspects such as um, uh, resilience. Uh, over the last weeks I've also addressed this program again at other me meetings and particularly with clinicians and sometimes when they see the evidence they say what are we waiting for? We want this to be implemented in all schools in uh, Ireland and, and to be honest I do agree with them and sometimes you you may require some time and, and you know, to, to make modifications and adjustments but it's very rare to see a program with these very positive and significant outcomes. The outcomes paper was published in the Lancet, which, which is obviously then uh, an indication of very rigorous peer review. So uh, I, I don't think we can achieve more uh, positive outcomes and, and significance than what we have seen uh, here. Um, as with many other studies, we like to involve the target group or representatives of the target group themselves, whether it's clinical intervention or uh, the positive mental health promotion uh, program. So here you can see some statements from young people that further clarify the needs for more activity, more initiatives in this uh, area. Uh, and these are statements from both boys and girls. So, so it underlines the importance of these positive mental health uh, promotion um, uh, programs. So, for example, more mental health uh, classes, um, get someone who had a problem to give a talk in a, in a school. So, so, so there is, in the current generation, definitely more openness and, and interest and, and uh, eagerness to talk about mental health uh, issues. So, uh, just watching, I know we are fine on time, so I would like to move now a little bit more upwards to the middle ages and see what specific risk factors we have identified uh, there. And many of you probably at this stage know that in, in this geographic region we have a very good working relationship with the coroner. So the Suicide Support and Information System was set up uh, already in 2008 and it's still uh, running with a very big advantage that uh, we then within the NSRF we have so much more uh, earlier, earlier access to information and data from people who die by uh, suicide and at the moment the time when window is, I'm even looking at routes, yeah, it's about six months, eh? so whereas when we have to wait for data from the CSO this is a delay of about two, two years. Yeah. The other advantage is in the system we uh, are not only uh, using all the information from the coroner's records but with a certain proportion, very high proportion in fact, of people, um, so really family members, agreed to engage in a so-called psychological autopsy interview and we had a very good response rate to obtain specific information from um, the GP or the psychiatrist who was involved with the person prior to uh, that. Before I go into the age-specific characteristics, but here, uh, well, not just pregnancy, we are dealing with predominantly with men. Um, and the, some of these cases obviously still very much cover the recession time, so it's not a surprise to see high levels of em uh, unemployment. But a key message to take away is that um, what commonly constitutes suicide risk is not simply one event or saying this person became unemployed, but it's very strongly the uh, combination between, uh, for example, socio-economic adversity, but also enduring mental health uh, issues. And we can even see also the high level 
of previous uh, self-harm. For some people, this could have covered five years, ten years, or even uh, longer. Uh, over two-thirds were also diagnosed with depression, and alcohol and drug abuse was also very high. However, that starting from the time, uh, from the start of the uh, recession, there were some specific target groups, uh, so people working in the construction of the production sector, who had, uh, in those days, uh, an elevated risk of suicide. But, suicide. but it wasn't primarily only because of unemployment or uh, losses in their lives. It was compounded by mental health uh, issues. And unfortunately, uh, Ireland, compared to our surrounding uh, countries, was the only country where I think we were really entering a paradoxical situation because there were many austerity measures as well. People lost their medical card, waiting lists for the mental health services, so, and some people couldn't even pay their antidepressants anymore. So, so that is an important factor to take into account as well. So through the uh, SSIS and having access to all consecutive cases, we came to quite striking differences between at least two important demographic groups. So men aged younger than 14 years and those aged uh, older. And especially, again, the, well, the usefulness of this information was shown last week when Senator Black uh, came along and she said, what evidence do you have? I said, well, we have almost too much evidence because the, the, the consistency of uh, men aged 40 years and older, and uh, so based on our updates, it's closer to 85% of the people, of the men who died by suicide, suicide they had a history of alcohol uh, uh, abuse. Obviously there are many actor factors as well, but that was very much standing out for these uh, particular men. Then, compared to the younger men, um, also these men uh, had much more often issues with physical illness, but not as a standalone, because it was linked to depression uh, uh, as well. So, for, for, for us, it, it becomes step by step clear that there is an important distinction uh, between certain subtypes and subgroups, and that you can't just say, oh, this time for everybody, was it depression, was it alcohol? No, it's about uh, identifying in a more specific way the combination of uh, factors. So the last part of this uh, lecture, I would like to present to you some really very new findings, and this is part of the so-called five-year HRB-funded uh, program. So Fraser Regan is here, Ruth Benson, Dorothy Lee is also intensively working on this uh, project. Now, these are first outcomes. But, of course, I wouldn't show them to you if we wouldn't be able to stand over. So we've done a lot of checking. So we also check this against the international uh, research. And, and, and we, we find emerging evidence for uh, similar subgroups in other countries. So in the program, we have um, made a lot of efforts over the last uh, 12, 12 to 18 months to uh, get more access and approach people with high-risk self-harm so who enter the emergency department to engage in an interview with us, and the response rates are fairly good, particularly down to an excellent interviewer who is with us, and also the group of major repeaters. So these are people who come to the emergency department and they have a history of five or more previous self-harm presentations, and in a minute you see the total range of these presentations. So it's a prospective interview where um, I don't have the exact response rate here, but with the high-risk self-harm uh, group, the response rates have gone up. With the major repeaters, it is a bit challenging, but in addition to the interview data, we have also access to information from uh, case files. An excellent interdisciplinary research team, and that's very important because we work with people in the hospital, but also we have input from people with uh, lived experience, or at least at the start of the, um, the, the research. So here we have uh, information on 233 consecutive uh, cases, so who met the criteria for high-risk uh, self-harm. And what is already immediately striking is in this particular subgroup, we find two-thirds are represented by men. And if you take the national gender distribution for self-harm, the majority are women. So this is, this is already a different group 
the mean age is much higher than the uh, national average. Interestingly, so despite the high lethality, uh, many also have a history of, uh, of at least one or more self-harm episodes. And alcohol abuse, quite striking. Uh, drug abuse, relatively high, and then also combination. And this, if, if, if you take into account that this is a mostly uh, a, a men, uh, a male represented group, uh, nearly 50% uh, uh, reports a uh, history of physical, sexual, or emotional uh, abuse. And even though uh, we're talking here about people, for example, with attempted hanging or attempted drowning, and some of these have just survived an act of self-harm, but yet they are engaging with the services. So from, from a health services point of view, you, 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 we have to ask the question, what is then happening with these men in the services? Uh, what assessments are being done? Or what assessments are not being done? Then we move to the group with major repetition. This is still a slightly smaller group, but again, we can rely on information from consecutive cases. And demographically, we see a very different uh, profile. So two thirds are women, so, so it's almost the reverse. And mean age is, is, uh, is um, they're older than the national average, but uh, particularly this combination uh, refers to a fairly specific group. Now, whilst the, 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 uh, the, ent the entry criteria or the eligibility criteria is uh, five episodes or more, we see the very striking finding of, of nearly 80% having a history of 10 or more self-harm acts. So, so we're really capturing here the major repetition uh, of self-harm uh, uh, people. Alcohol abuse is somewhat lower than in the other group. Drug abuse is fairly high. And this is obviously, this is, is really amazing and very remarkable, the very, very high level of history of physical, sexual, or emotional abuse. And in, in, in most of these cases, it is sexual abuse, but compounded by physical uh, maltreatment. So in other words, if we would have only looked at this through the window of the registry and say national, not regional, not so, we would never have been able to find out about this clinically relevant uh, group. The contact with uh, healthcare services is very high, yet, they're continuing to repeat. So, so again, an important question is being asked, do they get the right treatment? Do they have the appropriate therapeutic approach? Another very specific element is the high level of personality disorder, and this is new, uh, commonly borderline personality disorder, and the relatively high level of post-traumatic uh, stress disorder. So again, this uh, differentiates this particular group clinically very clearly from the other group. I think. Uh, am I still okay? You're okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so uh, there's a bit of movement, but you're very welcome. You you're coming at the end of the lecture, <laughs> but <laughs> maybe still take something. So yeah. So then uh, moving to um, some of the evidence-based interventions. Um, uh, so if we look at the people with this history of major uh, repetition, usually the clinical recommendation is dialectical behavior uh, therapy. And in general, we see fairly good outcomes in terms of reduced risk of repeated self-harm, uh, improved uh, skills, improved resilience. But we have, and I'll come to that in a minute, we have discovered some people who can't benefit from this approach. Cognitive behavior therapy has some uh, emerging positive effect on people with the highly lethal self-harm acts, but we don't have very specific trials about it. There, there were so many, so few specific studies on it that we couldn't even do a systematic uh, review. Then in addition, there's some growing evidence for so-called problem-solving therapy and for the more mild to moderate mental health um, problems, the internet-based psychotherapeutic interventions, and they're usually embedded in CBT uh, psychotherapeutic uh, techniques, techniques. But whilst we're obviously also dealing with men with repeated self-harm and men who engage in high-risk self-harm, uh, particularly in most of the RT, our RCTs, the randomized controlled trials, we find predominantly women. So we still don't know how effective, for example, DBT and CBT are in terms of uh, men. 
So as I already alluded, um, sometimes, and particularly a few years ago when, when DBT started here, and obviously it's a very positive development in uh, Ireland, but I came across some policy makers who indicated, well, DBT is probably the answer for everybody. I said, no, 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 I don't think so, because there are many different subgroups. And here, in the last two years, we really have seen people who are not able to benefit from uh, such evidence-based uh, interventions. So particularly people who suffer from severe post-traumatic disorder uh, symptoms, and also people who then continue to repeat self-harm, even whilst they are engaging in these therapeutic interventions. And to some extent, we can say if these post-traumatic stress symptoms are so high, that also means that people quite often use the so-called defense mechanism of dissociation. So they have to dissociate certain extreme and still uh, traumatizing thoughts or intr intrusions. So that's also hindering that they can benefit from these uh, uh, treatments. So, so there are now two recent studies that show that the greater the severity of these post-traumatic symptoms, the lower the likelihood that self-harm will, um, will, will improve or that it will uh, reduce. So and yeah, so very important uh, challenge that, that we're facing is so there's a growing number of people who have PTSD. They are also diagnosed with borderline personality uh, disorder but they're not really benefiting from this intensive uh, approach. So um, the, the debate about this has started with colleagues in Imperial College. So uh, Dr. Kirsten Barnicott, she was also with us when we had a seminar in April. And they're looking more and more at a combined, combining modules to approach PTSD, but in conjunction with uh, DBT. So, uh, but, but so far, no randomized control, control trial has been conducted in this uh, area. So we're looking at some initial studies where DBT has been combined, for example, with imaginal ex exposure, and so people reliving certain uh, events, but with very clear guidance from trained uh, psychotherapists, and at the same time working at the level of the uh, personality uh, disorder. Uh, some evidence also from trauma-focused uh, CBT. And um, when I was uh, at the international conference, some people were proposing the so-called eye movement desensitization and recrossing te technique. There's evidence for this um, in terms of incidental trauma. So people who haven't gone through uh, lifelong severe uh, abuse, but who may have been in, in a once-off accident. There, we see very good benefits of this approach, but it hasn't yet been verified. Would this work in conjunction with DBT with people who have this severe um, um, trauma? So coming to the end, I again would like to, uh, so in addition to the findings and, and the proportions of, of people who may not be benefiting from this approach, it's important to highlight some cases as well, because it's, our concern started with some of the cases that we, we came across, and then there was a second case, and a third case, and a fourth case. So, uh, but but this is a very, these are two very illustrative cases as to why we need to invest more in, uh, I would say, needs-geared treatment approaches for people, particularly with combined post-traumatic stress disorder and personality uh, disorder. So, uh, so the, the, the story of Jane is obviously very sad story and uh, so I met her on a few occasions and she's aged 35 years, diagnosed with borderline personality disorder, depression and PTSD, very long history of self-harm. I think it had started at, with her at the age of 14, if I'm uh, correct. Uh, many treatments, both pharmacological and also psychological, but with limited uh, outcomes. And believe it or not, but she had even completed a full 12 month dialectical behavior therapy, yeah, where usually then people see improvements, but unfortunately not with her. And then in recent months, she started revealing about severe abuse that had started in childhood, but she also felt very conflicted because the perpetrator was still alive. So, so it was very hard for her to work that uh, through. 
Um, at the same time, there were admissions, so sometimes she went for inpatient treatment, also outpatient treatment, but again with very limited benefits. And her repeat acts became more lethal over time. And very sadly, she died by suicide so late uh, last year. Then another uh, lady, uh, so the names are different, but uh, so in recent months I'm linking in with this particular uh, person. So she's 42 years of age, and you see the, the history compared to Jane is uh, fairly uh, similar. Now, coincidentally, she hadn't had the opportunity yet to, to avail of DBT, but she's very much looking around for the best possible therapeutic approach. Uh, one big difference, she has felt able and capable to open up about her long-standing experience with sexual abuse, started in childhood and very, very sadly by her uh, parents, followed by three other perpetrators, uh, and paradoxically even during the time when she was in the children home, this refers to Scotland. Um, so supported by her GP and two other mental health professionals, um, She's now exploring the most appropriate treatment. And uh, with this support, I think she has felt encouraged to open up and to also come forward to the Scottish inquiry for child abuse. And this, this has only happened in uh, recent months. But still, she has very, very many uh, challenges. And, and sometimes when I receive, uh, or at least in the early times when I started to know her, she sent messages, uh, which I found in the morning at night time. And initially I thought, oh, maybe this is a lady who's suffering from domestic violence because the, the, the way she wrote about some of the experiences at night and was as if it is re was really happening. So I liaised with somebody and said, this must be domestic violence, but it wasn't. So at night time, she re-experienced the violence and the abuse that had happened 10 years ago, 20 years ago, or uh, more. So there are positives there, but still many challenges. And currently, her children, and she has one granddaughter, are there for her then the main reasons to uh, stay alive. So, and then you may be surprised what I'm showing to you now, because I was surprised. So this, this is a great positive. So a few weeks ago, from uh, Sheila, I got these most amazing uh, paintings. And she sent them to me um, by email, and she said, uh, many, many times over the last weeks I was wondering, shall I send these to you or not? Because maybe you find them terrible, but she said, I want you to have the right, uh, or we want you to be honest. Is this rubbish or not? And she did say, I had had a few occasions where uh, I wanted to destroy them. But then later on she said, it wasn't me who wanted to destroy them. Huh? It was uh, all connected to the adversity. And so, to be honest, I wouldn't be able to make these paintings. So I wrote back to her, obviously very supportive, and I said, well, what I can see here is resilience, persistence, but also a huge expression of talent. So I say, hold on to that huh? until, until we have the route for you in terms of the best uh, treatment uh, approach.